Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today we will be reading The Little Black Boy by William Blake. Now, if you've been following along in the series I've been doing on the songs of innocence and experience by William Blake, you'll know that this is the, um, I think, the fourth poem I've done. I've done The Introduction, The Echoing Green, and The Lamb. And then now we're doing The Little Black Boy. Um, now you don't have to, I, I try to do these as standalone products so that you could just understand this one poem. But one of the arguments I've made many, many times, and I'll keep making is that you are missing, you are doing yourself and the author and the world. <laughs> it's a lot of problems, a disservice. If you're not reading a whole book of poetry in the, the vein that it was intended by the author. So an author like William Blake, who is one of the great six romantic poets poets uh, of the 1700s and 1800s. He's from the first generation, and in fact, he's the oldest of all of them. And he, along with any great writer, really, had a very conscious, purposeful reason for why they created in the way that they created. So when you're reading a poem, say, from... Um, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, or what a, a series that I just finished up on uh, by William Wordsworth, Lyrical Ballads, that they are, you might take a poem outside of it and read Tintern Abbey by itself. But Tintern Abbey was the last poem included in a series that Wordsworth and Coleridge put together. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, another romantic poet, very conscientiously, they debated, they discussed, they wrote letters back and forth. They figured, should we put this? Let's cut that. Let's, let's cut that one. Let's add this. Let's change the verbiage of this one a little bit to fit into the, uh, the you know, tenor of the overall, po the overall series. They were, and then they would temper it. And there's other versions of the lyrical ballads. So there's a 1798 version of Lyrical Ballads, and then there's an 1802 version of Lyrical Ballads, and then there's an 1805. So they kept wanting to make it better, to improve it, to make it um, you know, even uh, more precise or based on their own learnings and how they've grown as intellectuals. So my point is that if you read Tintern Abbey, which is in Lyrical Ballads, by itself, you're going to get a lot out of it. If you read it as a book, as the series, it's going to change your life. If you read The um, Little Black Boy by William Blake out of context, it's going to be amazingly interesting. If you read it within the Songs of Innocence and Experience, you're going to get the totality of this person's ideology, their sense of life, what they're trying to communicate, the artistry of everything. So, it, you know, it's like reading a really good chapter out of a book out of context and out of a novel, right? We wouldn't do that. And we shouldn't do that with great poems and great poetry books like this. So I think we should try to read them all together. So I would recommend if you haven't seen them and you really want to, then go back to uh, go to jubidormag.com. And, um, you know, I have posts for each of them. And then when I'm done with the whole series, as I did with Lyrical Ballads, I, I combined them all in one blog post so you can see all the links to everywhere you want to go. Um, okay, so that's a long prelude to this introduction for the, the um, not the Chimney Sweeper. We're going to get to the Chimney Sweeper by William Blake, but The Little Black Boy. And one of the reasons I brought this up is that there's an underlying theme that is harder to see when you read this poem by itself than when you read it in context with the echoing green, the introduction, or the piper, as it's sometimes called, of the uh, Songs of Innocence, uh, the lamb, and the shepherd, which we skipped for now, but I'm going to read it with three other short poems. They're the pastorals of William Blake's Songs of Innocence. Now, the little black boy is where one of his underlying themes does become a little bit more clear. As I said before, William Blake is the most Christian of all the Romantics, although he is equally the most, or at least equally uh, against the church. So he's for the Christian religion, uh, the Christian belief system, the value structure.
structure. He's like, if you know Jordan Peterson, he's very much like Jordan Peterson, where it's not, you know, the church is not necessarily the place you should go to find religion. You should go to the text. You should use your mind. You should think. You should use imagery and, and you know, understand the imagery and so on and so forth and interpret it um, the best that you can. And that's what William Blake was about. He And he, in fact, he expanded on this and created his own worlds from the Christian belief system. And we're going to get a lot of imagery here. We're getting a lot of imagery in his stories ahead of, you know, uh, um, in other poems that he's done already and others that we'll see a lot of Christian imagery. Now, I want to just really briefly say something about you're an atheist, maybe, right? I'm an atheist. Um, you know, I, and that you may think, well, what's the point in reading Christian doctrine poetry, right? Although this isn't doctrine, it's, but it is imagistic. It's, very, it's got a lot of imagery from Christianity. Well, one reason is that whether for better or for worse, the imagery that is included is def, you know, and the imagery that is this Christian ideology imagery is certainly enmeshed in the world that you live in, if you live in the West. It's heavy. It's everywhere. It's in the movies, the songs. You know, it's subconscious. You don't even know it's there all the time. But it's everywhere. I mean, all over the place, it's just a part of your life. And so it's very helpful to see and understand that imagery for yourself and be able to manipulate and play it with it for yourself so that you're a master of the imagery rather than being mastered by the imagery. So that's my main argument is that if you want to live in a world, in my view, and this is one of the reasons to read literature, where you are the master manipulator. You are not, not that you're manipulating people negatively, but I mean that you are able to manipulate words, ideas, thoughts, not that you are manipulated by words, ideas, thoughts, which in our political system today is definitely the case where people are constantly being manipulated. I think it's why we're getting these bad authoritarians because people do not want to think for themselves. And so that's what we have, you know, going on in our culture and, and it's, you know, always there, but it's big right now, of course. And reading literature will help you think for yourself. And part of the way it does that is by, you know, you analyzing and you contemplating this scenario, that, you know, this, this poem in this case, um, using these words in, in classical uh, or, or ancient Christian imagery and how William Blake twists them and moves them around and plays with them and manipulates them for the purpose of, you know, the reason he chose poetry and um, imagery, he's also a great artist, is he wants to jar you into thinking. That's one of the things that poems force you to do. If you read, like, a, as I always say, Poems are not meant to be read. They're meant to be reread. You cannot just read a poem once. Not even a good poem two or three times. Like you need to read it like a dozen times, especially a short poem like this. And the point is, that's the point. So Wordsworth had debated, should I write prose or should I write more verse? And the reason he chose verse, is conscious. one of his conscious reasons was, that it forces you to reread the sentence. Like, did I get that right? What does that mean? What is he saying with this word? Because the structure is important and the way that they use words is important and, the, and you know, making it rhyme is important and it also sticks in your memory better if it's rhyming that way. It you know, flows better with the, the sound versus prose, which is much more forced and, and separated from the natural way that you might speak. So the point is that there is a lot of value in um, understanding Christian poetry and understanding where it's coming from and, and the world that we live in. So I hope that that motivates you a little bit to want to know about the Songs of Innocence experience. I think there's also just an intellectual enjoyment in playing around with these imageries and, and thinking about what William Blake is trying to say. Um, and in this case, this is actually, I think, a universal important thing, especially um, you know, in the era that he's writing. Okay, so let's read this poem, and then I'm going to show you um, the images. So I'm going to I'm going to read the poem to you. I just realized like it's echoing in my head. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I don't. Did you catch that? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to read this poem to you in the way that Blake does not want you to read it, which is on a blank sheet of white paper. The way he wants you to read it is what I will show you after I do my first reading. 
uh, which is an illustration that he did by hand. This is why he was not the most popular of the Romantics because he did all this stuff by hand. He wrote these, these he drew these beautiful, um, you know, illustrations, and he colored them all in by hand and so on. And it, you know, he made very few copies of them, and didn't have a big following. And this until later in, in life when they were able to you know mass produce them. And Okay, and by the way, if you're listening, it's okay. You know, I'll describe the illustrations. You can see the illustrations at troubadourmag.com. So I'll have the audio. If you're listening on, you know, podcast or something, I'll put those up on troubadourmag.com. You can look at them on your phone or just look at them later. I'll, I'll describe them as well. But I do recommend looking at them at some point. I think it does help. It's not mandatory for listening to the poem, but it's how he wanted you to see the poem, and I think it will help you in understanding the poem. So let me read The Little Black Boy by William Blake. I'm going to not give you, I'm going to not give you too much of a preface on the, um, some of the obvious feelings you might have just in me saying the words, the little black boy. I don't want to say too much about that yet. 1789, this was published and originally, by the way. The Little Black Boy by William Blake My mother bore me in the southern wild, and I am black, but oh, my soul is white. White as an angel is the English child, but I am black as if bereaved of light. My mother taught me underneath a tree and sitting down before the heat of day, she took me on her lap and kissed me, and pointing to the east, began to say, Look on the rising sun. There God does live, and gives his light, and gives his heat away. And flowers and trees and beasts and men receive comfort in morning, joy in the in noonday. And we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. And these black bodies and this sunburnt face is but a cloud and like a shady grove. For when our souls have learned the heat to bear, the cloud will vanish. We shall hear his voice saying, Come out from the grove, my love and care and round my golden tent like lambs rejoice. Thus did my mother say and kissed me, and thus I say to little English boy, when I am from black and he from white cloud free, and round the tent of God like lambs we joy, I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear to lean in joy upon our father's knee. And then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair and be like him, and he will then love me. So I don't know um, if I read it as well as I could for you. I hope I did, but I hope that you felt a little shiver at the end in that last stanza. I'll shade him, the little English white boy, from the heat till he can bear the heat, the heat of God, and we're going to go through this, to lean in joy upon our Father's knee so that he can be closer to God, that he's capable now of being closer to God. And then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair and be like him, and he will then love me. So there's something about reassurance in this poem that's important. Let me first show to you this uh, illustration. So this is how in 1789... In the 1700s, the, the late 18th century, you would buy and read this poem. This is how it was intended by William Blake to be seen. Now, I wish um, you know you could see a clear in your hands version that's you know hand drawn, so you could see the you know all the colors and how it looks, how good it looks. Now. You'll notice that there's the tree, right? That the mother tells this story. So this is um, an African mother 
she bore him, right? He's look, he's, his eyes are looking there and he's pointing up. Here's the a bright sun that's red and its beams are, are beaming on them. And there, you know, we see a metaphor about the sunbeams burnt them. And we're going to talk about that. And that's why they're black. And then of course, in the next um, image is an image of the black boy tenderly touching the white boy as the little white boy is now able to, you know, stand at the feet of this, of their father. Now the father is some angel, perhaps Jesus, maybe even a figure of God itself. And through the ability of the white, the black boy who has borne the heat, the pressure, the difficulty of God's rays, he's able to shade the white boy so that he can, until he can learn to stand, um, you know, bear, forbear, being close to um, the father, right? So that's what they said at the end of the poem. So we're going to explore this a little bit to um, kind of understand what is going on, because there are several layers of what's happening. One thing, as I've mentioned in the past with William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, is that his view of, you know, the, the subtitle is showing the contrary states of the human soul, the two contrary states. And the two contrary states are innocence and experience. And there, he thinks of it as a dialectic process where there's a conversation back and forth. And we saw in some poems, um, and we're going to see more of this, where there's a, a song of innocent and there's a contrary song of experience. Now, in this one, there's not exactly that, as far as I understand. There's not a, a, con, a comparison poem in the songs of experience. Although you're going to get some poems that kind of echo it, but not not like you get with um, the most one of the clearer ones, which is the lamb in the Songs of Innocence and the tiger in the Songs of Experience. But it's still, that dialectic process is still going on here. And dialectic process, process is for, you know, it's not, I, I don't agree with it phil fundamentally philosophically, but there is something to the idea of conversation is what, in, you know, brings you to an elevated understanding of some idea. So you have one idea or one person, you know, like a like a, a Socratic dialogue. We have one person representing one idea, and they're hammering home this idea. Maybe they're like a, a nationalist, right? And then you have another person who's another idea, and then together they converse, and hopefully through the conversation they get to some new third uh, idea or set of ideas, and that's a dialectic process essentially. That's kind of what goes on here. And you see that in his poems a lot, where it's like a little boy, it's his mother talking to and teaching the little boy through conversation, and then the little boy talking to another little boy, the black boy talking to a, a white boy. So there's, there, But by doing that, there's going to be layers that are going on here, I think. So let's go through this poem quickly, and then we're going to do um, some imagery. Um, actually, let's do the imagery first, and then we'll go through the poem. I think it'll help. So first off, um, my mother, no, poem, reading poem again. My mother bore, uh, then the imagery. My mother bore me in the southern wild. Southern wild is going to be Africa, right? The southern wild. So he was born, bore in the southern wild, and I am black, but oh, my soul is white. So what is he saying? I mean, it's pretty simple. One of the things I mentioned in other um, recordings of Songs of Innocence is to read these poems, the Songs of Innocence, to a young child and see what they think of it. And there is a surface level. This one's a little more complicated, but still, like the lamb, there's a surface level, which just it's just a story about a boy talking to a lamb. And this one's just a, a boy talking to his mother or being talked to by his mother and then talking to a little black boy, white boy. And that's it. It's very simple. You know, um, my I am black, so his skin is black, but his soul is white. And we all understand what he means by that. Even if, like, if I ask you, what does he mean by his soul is white? You'll say, oh, it's pure, spotless, perfect, right? Now, of course, we're going to get in this story a kind of a questioning of that binary view of things. Like, why is white, you know, going to be good and black, by contrast, not necessarily as good? And this is a, or, you know, not, not good. And that's a view that was prominent at this time in history. And he goes on, white as an angel is the English child, but I am black as if bereaved of light. So he's, he's going to talk about this bereaved of life, light, 
and that's an important thing. Of course, we know that evolutionarily, you know, which evolution, the theory of evolution comes later. We know that the pigmentation of a black person is probably is actually the opposite it's because of the, um, you know, adapting to the light and, and so on. So not that they're bereaved of light. So in the next stanza, my mother taught me underneath a tree and sitting down before the heat of day, she took me on her lap and kissed me and pointing to the east began to say. So very simple, just sit on, you know, sit on the lap of a mother, a little black boy, and she's going to tell him a little story. Looking on the rise, look on the rising sun, there God does live and gives his light and gives his heat away. Right? He's giving you something, he's surrendering his heat for you. And flowers and trees and beasts and men receive comfort in morning joy in the noonday. Which is true. We understand that we feel good in the morning. You know, we get this joy in the afternoon. Um, you know, there, so there's, there's this idea that light is good and darkness is bad. That's where bad things happen. Historically, this is true. Um, and we are put on earth a little space that we, and by we, you know, black people, her, you know, these southern... Um, southern wilds, people grown in southern wilds with black skin who were brought to this white place, this place of all these white people. And we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. And these black bodies and this sunburnt face is but a cloud and like a shady growth. So she's reassuring him. Now, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but why does she have to reassure him? What is she reassuring him from? What's going on in their lives where she has to make him feel better about something. Next stanza. For when our souls have learned the heat to bear the cloud will vanish, we shall hear his voice. So once we've, you know, removed from the shackles of the, the body, we, and we've, because we've learned to bear his heat, the cloud will vanish. We'll, we'll be able to hear the voice. The voice of who? The voice of God. And the voice saying, coming out from the grove, my love, come out from the grove, my love, and care, and round my golden tent like lambs rejoice. So we will be able to be closer to God when we're dead in the afterlife because we've borne this heat. We've bared it. We've been able to survive it. That thus ne next stanza thus did my mother say and kissed me and thus I say to little English boy so now the mother told him a story he's telling the little English boy a story now we don't know what the English boy says about this or if he agrees or things that's silly we don't know any of the stuff that he might say here um, thus did my mother say and kissed me and thus I say to little English boy when I from black and he from white cloud free so when we've left earth we're dead right? we go into heaven and round the tent of God like lambs we joy. So now we're in this tent. Think of him as like a king. Um, you know, you, a golden tent might be a, uh, from, you know, Old Testament, like a, a conquering king might come in and put out this big gold tent, and that's where you would meet him. So it's just kind of imagery of that. We're going to get into the imagery in just a second here. And round the tent of God's, God like lambs we joy. Last stanza. I'll, I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear to lean in joy upon our father's knee, father being God, and then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair and be like him, and he will then love me. Okay. Now, some imagery is probably clearer, like you, you may know it, or, or maybe you didn't even think about it, but you do know it. Like if we were to ask you and quiz you, you'd probably figure it out. One of the chief imagery is right here. On the, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or on tubitormag.com, you'll see a tree. Uh, you'll see the illustration by Blake, which has a tree, a, you know, a, a black mother, a black boy, the sun, you know, over a grassy vale valley. Now, a tree is, in you know, very simple but profound or or resonating meaning to Christian audiences, of course, means the tree of knowledge from the Bible. And this is the tree where uh, J um, Eve was tempted by the devil 
and you know by the way i didn't even notice this till now but you could actually see what looks like almost a snake like i don't know if that's supposed to be a snake like figure but it almost looks like there's a snake like figure leaning against the tree and so we're gonna get some you know blake is a an expert in christian ideology and imagery he knows the bible he knows all the songs he knows everything so there's not something that he's you know doing accidentally right like it just subconsciously popped up like he knows what he's doing so we have this tree we have it's a tree of knowledge and what is she doing she's you know dropping some knowledge she's teaching him she's giving him information she's conveying something she's reassuring him with this story so this says he's saying something about the way mothers reassure their children and there is something about that i mean if you think about how we reassure our children where you know maybe they'll ask us a hard question about you know what happened to auntie may or something like that we'll tell a story but really, Auntie May, you know, had a horrible accident and died miserably or something. Like, and we're not going to tell them that. We're going to reassure them that everything's okay. Or, you know, like the easiest one example is the stories we tell children when their dog dies, right? When your dog died, what do you say? Oh, we took him down on the farm, right? We took him to the farm. He's going to be happy. He's going to be running with other dogs. And then your, do- your, your kid is, you know, he's sad. He cries a little bit because he misses his dog. But then he's reassured. He could close his eyes and be, oh, that dog, you know, little lassie is playing around. I'm so happy. Really, the dog's dead, right? We know the dog's dead. You know the dog's dead. Everyone knows the dog's dead, right? Same thing with goldfish and so on and so forth. So we have these kind of reassuring lies that we tell to children in order to make them feel better. So what kind of reassuring lie is she telling him? She's telling him that, The reason we're black, right? Because this is not a question this child would ask in Africa. Let's let's make that clear. So they're born. He was born in Africa, the Southern Wilds. Why is he in England? I think you probably understand and know they're slaves. This is during the slave era. So William Blake is going to be saying something about the slave era. The arguments made by um, slavers and by Christians. So we often think that, oh, the Christians were the ones who made the arguments to free the slaves. And that's true, but they also made the arguments to enslave the slaves. So it was also, you know, the idea that they are, you know, black, that they do, they're they lesser than, that they're not pure, that these types of ideas are very powerful and prevalent in, this, in the, uh, the culture at this time. And so, what Blake decides to do is to put a play on the binary between black and white and to challenge some of those ideas. And he does it through the voice of a child. So you can't fully question all of his logic, right? Because it's a, it's a child saying this. So just like we get with, um, you know, under this tree, this is how we convey knowledge. This is how Christians convey knowledge. They represent it in this tree. They pass on you know, um, they fall from innocence once Eve was tempted by the apple. She gives, and then she gives it to Adam. And there's a lot of that going on here. And the lesson, so the boy learns this lesson. He internalizes it. In fact, he internalizes the lesson so well, he's going to teach it to a little white boy, right? He's going to tell the little white boy the story that this woman made. Now, he's not going to teach the white boy about general Christianity. The mother is trying to protect her child. And so she's telling him a fable, a story, and an idea of how they became different from the people around them. And it's supposed to be a reassuring one. My mother taught me underneath the tree and sitting down before the heat of day, she took me on her lap and kissed me. It's very loving. She cares about him. Obviously, she's it's mother and child. She said, look on the rising sun. There God does live. He gives his light and gives his heat away and flowers and trees and beasts and men receive comfort and morning, you know, so flowers and beasts. So everything is able to live because of the light and the heat of the sun, which is God. So here's a simple metaphor between there. And we black people are put on earth a little space, right? And that we may learn to bear the beams of love, hardship, difficulty, slavery. That the hard, you know, because the question is, why is this little, this boy is 
seeing and has no concept. He's an innocent, right? Songs of innocence. He has no concept of why is it that you are half naked, enslaved, in chains, you know, uh, digging ditches for these people and they get to sit up in their towers. Like, he, he doesn't say that, but he, he can see, like, there's a difference. And why is there a difference? And that's what he... And she's saying that we bear the beams of love, and this is a metaphor for the difficulty of life, and these black bodies and this sunburned face is but a cloud. So we are actually put on earth, she said, to this little black boy, in order to protect the, and to, to provide a shade for the, the white people. But why? From what? God, God's love. So we, in other words, he's saying the opposite of what a lot of Christians would have said at this time, which is that as a black person, they are more capable of, of experiencing God's love, right? Which is the opposite of what they, they would have said at this time, which is that they're less capable, that the white people are the more pure. So right, right from here, this is one flip that um, Blake is putting on this, whole, the spin he's putting on this. He's saying, no, 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 because they're black, they're sunburned, you know, just like, you know, if you put something out there, if you sit out too long, your skin changes. They were out way too long and their skin turned black and that's why they're black. But that means that because the sun is God and God is getting in their love down, they're able to bear the heat of it. And this also goes to the idea in Christianity that life is about what happens in the afterlife. And therefore what you get is, um, what you get is the, what you get is the, the ability to, um, you know, bear and control or to, to, um, experience the love and then shade protect the white people. Right. And then she goes on for when our souls have learned the heat to bear the cloud. And, and again, the metaphor of the afterlife is that the, we bear and forbear in the in life. We put up with the sins of the body, the difficulties, the miseries, the evil, the pestilence, the plagues, the, the death and misery and suffering of the world in order to live in God's life for the rest of eternity. That's the Christian viewpoint. And what uh, Blake is all of a sudden saying is that black people are more capable of that because they're suffering more. Right. And so this has to make Christians scratch their head and be like, Oh man, wait a second. Right. Like that's, that's, that's an interesting point or that's not true. They get all upset. Right. He's trying to play with their emotions. He's trying to get that audience to, to think about wait, what is this thing you're saying? You're saying that suffering in life is important for enjoying the afterlife. Well, then you're not going to enjoy the afterlife as much because you're not suffering enough. Right. And, but these people are, they're, they're suffering. And so they're stronger and they're more capable of enjoying God's life. So he's twisting the ideology of the Christians of this time. And really, I think, you know, this is embedded in all Christianity. You know, people are just interpreting it differently today. Um, and these black bodies and this sunburned face is but a cloud and like a shady grove. For when our souls have learned to the, the heat to bear, learned to bear the heat, the cloud will vanish. We shall hear his voice saying, so the cloud's going to vanish one day, and that's after we die, and we will be able to hear his voice. His voice, God's voice, is going to say, come out from the grove, my love and care, and round my golden tents like lambs rejoice. Now, the mother's poem um, story is done. Right? She has passed the knowledge on to the boy. Now the boy is going to pass this knowledge on to, or have you know, talk to the little white boy, the, the little black boy is. Thus did my mother say and kissed me, and thus I say to little English boy, when I from black and he from the white cloud free, you know, metaphor for death, uh, and round the tent to God of God like lambs we joy, I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear it, to lean and joy upon our father's knee. And then I'll stand and stroke his hair, his silver hair, and be like him, and he will then love me. Now there's, there's several ways that this can be you know easily taken in terms of it's a reassuring tale of for this little black boy this little black boy is being told this tale so that he can bear the the horrible life that he's been allotted right he's been chosen um outside of his own abilities 
he has had he has no will in this life that he's chosen. He, he has been selected by people to bear this horrible life of slavery. And so the mother tells him a tale to try to make him feel better and, and experience something. And we're, we're going to see this in other um, poems in Songs of Innocence, but it's been there since the beginning. In the Piper and in the Echoing Green, we see a little bit of the, the, the tales that parents tell their children that are full of crap, basically full of it, in order to make them feel better and to you know, experience and enjoy the, what they can out of life. And it's a way for a mother to protect her child, right? Now, so, so he does internalize this and he tells it to the boy, the white boy. And um, this is saying something about the tales people in general say, even just Christians. Like, maybe there's something wrong with the stories you're telling your child. You may be telling, you know, stories to make them feel better about something that's bad in the world or bad in themselves that you, th that you may think is bad in themselves, right? And you're really just spinning things to make them feel better. And then on another level, it's telling something about the way we indoctrinate children. Right? This child is now indoctrinated to believe that his suffering is okay. And when we talk about today, the slave mentality, this is where it came from. This is an example of the essence of the slave mentality. And it's an acquiescence. A better story to tell this child would be, this is unjust. This is horrible. You know, you do not deserve this. The, the uh, white man has usurped your ability to, to be happy, to make choices, to fall in love, to choose your own. I'm getting a little emotional. Um, you need, you know, so what she should have said is how to rise up and fight back, even if it means your death, because dying would be better than living as a slave, right? That's the kind of thing she should have told him. Instead, she told him this tale of how to bear and forbear which is coming from Christianity. And I think there is a tint, even though, um, a hint, even though he is, Blake is a big proponent of religious ideology, he hates oppression and repression of all kinds. So even if it meant tearing down every brick of the church, which he would happily do, he is going, you know, that, that's what I think he's, he's you know, doing here. Is he's trying to point out that we're passing on this knowledge to oppress humans and that is horrible and it, it is horrible and he's right about that and he's trying to do it but he's doing it in the way that a poet would do it he's not doing it in the way that you know a, a sermon or a preacher might do it in, in kind of you know uh brimstone and fire type of a, a public speech or something like that so anyway the, you know that's the the uh, the lesson that the child is taking now some other images so there's the tree of course which is simple um, and by the way, this is in, even if athe even atheists, even the arc atheist Ayn Rand included a Christian symbol of the tree. And obviously trees in and of themselves aren't necessarily Christian symbols, but they are when they represent the thematically knowledge, um, you know, civilization, the essence of values in the West and uh, in, the, in the Western world. And in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, there is a very prominent an important thematic uh, image of a tree. And if you've read Atlas Shrugged, you know what I'm talking about. It's Eddie Willers, uh, the, the tree, or I don't know if it's on Eddie Willers' way. It's, I think it's on da maybe Dagny, the, the Taggart um, um, household, the, their property. And there's this tree that Eddie Willers, who represents the common man, there's this tree that's there, and it always gave him reassurance that everything was going to be okay. The trains are going to... Maybe there's something wrong with the train today, but tomorrow the train will run. Eventually, things will be great. The order of the world makes sense. And then he learns, though, and he, he reflects on this because he saw, you know, um, it was like struck by lightning, and he saw that it was actually rotted from the inside the whole time. It only appeared to be strong. It only appeared to have this presence of, you know, ancientness that had profoundness to it, right? And it assured him that the order of the world made sense, but it was actually rotted from the inside the whole time. And I, so Ayn Rand's playing on the, the you know, uh, an, an atheist 
she's using cr- Christian ideology, Christian imagery. So Christian imagery is everywhere. It's a prominent part of our world. And if you are a writer, I think you need to be very versed in it so you could do what Blake is doing and play on it and me- mess people up so that they're agreeing. Oh, yeah, I guess it makes sense that a black person is more pure. Oh, wait a second. So why are they slick? Like, like that's obviously it wouldn't be that stark, but it would, you know, that's the kind of idea that he's working with. Or he's trying to trying to engender. Okay, another image is East. So East is um from the Bible, of course. And you know, there's a, the rising sun is a simple one. So it rises in the east. It also in Christianity kind of represents resurrection um and and thus eternal life which is what we've been talking about with the cloud and removing from the cloud. And that, that metaphor means dying. It also represents civilization. So part of what's happening, as I mentioned, is that um, Blake is pointing out not only the way we indoctrinate black children, but the way that we indoctrinate, you know, more universally, the way we indoctrinate children as such, like they take, you know, and, it, and he mentions the kiss, right? It comes with love from his mother, it comes at the, you know, the breast of his mother, where he's, you know, from that moment of birth, she's coddling and loving and hugging and kissing him and feeding him. And from that, you know, like the idea from the breast milk, we're indoctrinated with our deepest values. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And but Blake is kind of pointing out the problem with this and the problem in this kind of reassuring. Cause again, she should have been reassuring him or not reassuring him about his uh, slavery and the horrible nature of his life. She should have been inspiring him and preparing him to go out and kill the enemy. I mean, if you're a black person at this time, the enemy is the white person. Now this is not true today. All right. Just to be clear, this is not at all true today. We have gone way past this, but at this time, Black people had at black slaves had every right to kill every white person in their path, period. Because they you cannot enslave another person and get away with it. It's just not just. And so you have no right to survive. I mean to live um, while you are you know in a society that is enslaving another person per, people. And so those people have every right. So every slave upro uh, you know uprising had every right to be that and to kill as many white people as they could. I mean, period. That's just the way it is. Um, because that's just justice. And that's what she should have been telling her child. It's about slave revolt, how to do it. She should have been giving him like little hints in her poetry and in her stories about how to whittle, um, you know, how to burn a house down with white people in it, which is to flint and a rock. Like that's what she should have been told, telling him like from the beginning. Instead, she gave him the opposite, right? And that's how we indoctrinate children to be acquiescent or to to do what we want them to do. You know, we do this today, with certain values that we do. I mean, even the way, you know, we make fun of like participation trophies, that's a certain type of indoctrination that, you know, you're going to win no matter what. And then the stories we tell about everybody's perfect and every culture is beautiful and the same and they're all equal. That's nonsense, right? But that's the stories we tell. I mean, there's a story called, um, there's a book that I, when I was a teacher, I saw all the teachers were in love with and they would all read it and parents would read it to their young, young, young kids called the giving tree. It's all about how great the giving tree is. And it's like, Okay, the giving tree is great, but the the message essentially is that we shouldn't we should just t- you know take whatever is dropped from the giving tree. There's not the opposite of um th- you know the mind tree, the tree of the mind that is able to extract amazing materials out of basically rocks and and you know nothing and barrels of sludge that we can turn into plastics and into glasses and into all my like. There's nothing like that. There's no books like that that I know. Right, but the giving trees, how beautiful, which is an environmentalist thing, and it's yada yada yada. That I mean, we're teaching environmentalists at the teat. <laughs> we are whether you you know, and which is the difficulty, and what you know he here in Blake is trying to say is the problem with that kind of value teaching. And East is a kind of representation of civilization in here, and that process, that process, that dialectic process, in a sense of teaching that, and then that child teaching that. Christian viewpoint and the child teaching that to the young white boy. There is also something in here um, about Cain, who um, you know left Eden after killing Abel, uh, or you know left the God's grace. And here's the uh, point from Genesis four sixteen: Cain, of course, killed Abel. 
after this, Cain left the um, the pre- presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which is basically a place of meanness and cruelty. So that's what East means. It means East of Eden, right? There's the Stein, Steinbeck's best work, definitely. Great book. I highly recommend reading East of Eden. And it's about, you know, can we ever overcome our innate evilness that's, it, you know, in our genes and, you know, through the, the generations that passed on every generation from Cain down to us, right? There's an evilness in us that is there. How can we ever overcome that? That's what that book is thematically about. So that's east, that's tree, that's you know what we're seeing in here. And then you have black body, sunburned face. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, there's an obvious universal understanding of this metaphor, which is, you know, just that you're out in the sun, you get burnt, right? And so that's how they are. And then of course, as I said earlier, the sun represents the love of God. Now, there is, I think, an added, you know, I was looking this up, and it looks like there's an added layer of Christian symbolism that I was unaware of until I looked it up from the Old Testament called the Song of Songs, 1-6. And it's, um, it's actually a, one of the more erotic poems about um, the love relationship, but it's also, uh, particularly, it's been interpreted, I think, <laughs> the way Christians tend to interpret things the way they want to interpret things, but you know, they've interpreted, uh, you know, between Christ and the soul, Christ and church, God, and like those types of love relationships. And that there's um, something about that. It's, it's about Solomon and a bride of his. And, and let me read a little, uh, just a quick little snippet from it. She says, the bride of the woman, I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am swarthy, black, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. So there is this um, idea of being burned by the uh, by the atrocities or the uh, meanness of others, right? The East uh, terminology by the civilization that you live in without any control. Um, by your of your own or any uh, choice of your own, you're put into this situation, this cruel situation, and that turned you black, right? And that's what's going on with the Song of Songs, and I think that's you know another layer to the metaphor of being burned by the harshness of the reality. So, I mean, in synopsis, this is a a very calm. It's a simple poem about in the Songs of Innocence. So again. A child would not see any of this. This is all stuff that I, as an experienced adult, experienced, as an experienced adult, uh, scare quotes there, that uh, is seeing all of this subtext and all the meanings and the layers of meanings and the images. And, and of course, the underlying meaning of the way we indoctrinate children and the problems with that and our faults in that and you know how this is not a good thing that we're doing and and or in, at least it's not a good thing in this case uh, at the very least with how we're indoctrinating black children to be reassured about their horribleness you know not their horribleness the horrible nature of the life that they're living excuse me because of the situation of slavery that we have or that the people at that time had uh, imposed on them so you know, that, that's one of the, the key themes that you're getting out of the little black boy. And it's all coming from a little black boy. So you could pick apart some of the logic that he's saying here, even from a Christian perspective. You know, there, there's things that they could say about, well, no, but you're, you know, still inferior. And, you know, but, but you, we can't let you know why. And, and you're not actually, you know, superior to us in, in soul. We're superior to you because we you know, provide you with food or something like there's just things that they could say, but you know, uh, it's because it comes from a little boy, you can't say them to a little boy because there's a little boy. You you can't really, you know, uh, you can't have that kind of discussion. Uh, you you can't have that logical discussion with him yet. You could just indoctrinate him. That's it. Um, and that's, you know, for instance, why I refuse to say there's any such thing as a, uh, Christian child. There's the, the children of a Christian parents, but children are not capable of coming up with and understanding metaphysics and epistemology and a theory of, you know, the various theories of, of, Christ, of 
theism versus atheism. You know, they just the free will versus they, they don't have the capacity at four or five years old to have that, you know, discussion, not even at 10 or 12 or 13. So there is no Christian child. There are just indoctrinated children who are, you know, the children of Christian parents. That's it. So you, you can't have that, you know, and that's what is happening with, with this poem here as well. If that this child is not a, a believer in the um, story that he's telling the white, that the mother told him and he's telling the white boy, but he is indoctrinated with it. And the, the question that we're going to be confronted with in future episodes and poems by Blake is, is this necessary? Can we get rid of it? Right? Or do we need it? Do we need it for our civilization to survive? And if we need it for our civilization to survive, to flourish, then is our civilization worth saving? Now, we're going to get into what it is, but just as a last uh, tidbit, this will be the last thing I say. This is happening. This is writing this. He published this in 1789 during the storming of the Bastille. This in the air is revolution where people are talking about, ter- just like today, we have talk about people tearing down all the civilizational structures that have been put in place over the last couple thousand years and starting over. And in fact, that's what France tries to do with the storming of the Bastille. And that's, um, that, that's part of the, the you know, French uh, revolution. Now, of course, in the Songs of Experience, we're going to get some more mature knowledge. And of course, this is published in 1794. It's not a coincidence that the reign of terror is 1793, where they're just like chopping off everybody's head and, you know, it's just a brutal bloodbath and it's just cleaning house and it's a horrible, you know, disaster in, in a lot of ways. And this is all going to be important in understanding the themes that are in the message that Blake is trying to get across. And I think these are still relevant to our day. I mean, the question is, you know, if you're taking a perspective of um, we are teaching our kids a lot of values that are not good, how do we get rid of that? Because, you know, the, we taught, the, their parents were taught the same thing. And then their parents were taught the same things. And then their parents were taught the same. Right? So it goes back generation. How do you break that cycle? Right? How do you break the cycle of um, accepting, acquiesce, acquiescing to slavery? the way uh, the slave mentality that a, a slaver or an ex-slave person will still always have a little remnant of that slave mentality where it's like, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, like that kind of thing, um, which even generations after slavery still was, you know, a part of the culture. How do you break that cycle? Because a lot of that mentality is bred into them from this birth, right? From, you know, the teat, as they say, from the milk. And that's, um, that's, that's the question. And us today, living today, you know, when you have feminists might think like, well, what do you do with like the chads and the brads of the day? Like, because their parents taught it to them, you know, boys will be boys. They don't, feminists don't agree with that. Well, how do we break that cycle? Do we do a Gillette commercial? Is that going to do it? Right. From their perspective, the feminist perspective, they're, you know, we're teaching uh, young boys to be rapists and killers. That's how they view the world somehow. But I don't agree with that, but that's how they view the world. Um, So how do we break that, right? And, you know, like for me, I think that we teach children to revere nature and and not revere the mind that is able to manipulate and exploit nature. Like that is a negative and nature is like some kind of golden positive. And um, not that nature is evil, but that um, nature without man is better. In other words, that I think is the prominent message we send to children today from the from the milk right? From birth. How do we get rid of that? Do we just destroy all of civilization and start over? Right? That's, that's kind of the question that Blake is struggling with here. So I'll leave it at that. I don't have, I'm not going to give you the answer or what I think is the answer. I do think there is an answer, but I'm not going to give you the answer. Blake proposes um, some ideas here, but he's not going to have a full answer himself, but he is going to, you know, it's embedded in, I'll just say it's embedded in that dialectic process there. Okay, so um, we'll talk some more next time. I think we'll explore uh, maybe the Blossom or even Chimney Sweeper next time. I think Chimney Sweeper's coming up. So we will, uh, I will see you soon.